Rod is not here. I also got many hairs cut, not a haircut. I got many hairs cut yesterday. I don't like my hair getting as long as it was. That's an issue only people that have hair understand. It's unmanageable. See this, I get up, pretty much done. But, so Rod is not here after his surgery on his shoulder. He called Lynette and I uh, Thursday or Friday, doesn't matter. He called us and said that uh, I should be ready to uh, have a lesson ready for Bible study. And then about an hour later, he called back and said, definitely have a lesson ready. So here I am. Before we begin, let us have a short prayer. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful and blessed to be called your children. You have given us the breath of life this day, Father, and for that we are so thankful. We pray, Father, as we study your word this morning, that, Father, we can glean from it things that help us to strengthen our faith, help us to be ready to give a defense for what we believe, to those who are outside of the body. We pray, Father, for those that wish to be here, but because of weather and other reasons could not make it, we pray, Father, that you be with them, guard them and keep them safe and return them to us. We pray, Father, that as we study the word this morning, that we would each be edified, but, Father, ultimately, that you would be glorified. Forgive us of our sins. This prayer we ask is in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. Is this a science book? In many ways, it is a science book. True science, accurate science, never ever contradicts what is written in the Word of God. So if science tells you A, and the Word of God tells you B, it's B. And somewhere down the road, science might figure it out. So today for our lesson, we're going to be going through scientific foreknowledge in the Bible. And there is a lot of evidence in Scripture. Again, it's not a science book. It's not a history book. But it teaches science, and it teaches history. So I'm going to read this because when I first read it, it just kind of blew my mind. In the beginning, there was nothing. And suddenly, for no reason, nothing exploded and created everything. That is the evolutionary theory. That is it, in a nutshell. In the beginning there was nothing, and suddenly for no reason nothing exploded and created everything. And they expect us to believe that. In fact, the majority of the world does believe that. At some point by chance, the right chemicals happen to float together at just the right moment to be stuck by an electrical charge and become life. And they expect us to believe that. Somewhere two non-human mothers gave birth to a human child. They were born at the same time and in the same place. One was male and one was female. These two new humans gave birth to the human race. And they expect us to believe that. One of the descendants of these first humans was born with knowledge of right and wrong. No longer driven by instinct, this person suddenly was making decisions based upon morality for which there is no real explanation, and they expect us to believe that. 
And if you speak up against that, if you're in a high school, if you're in a junior high school, if you're at the university and you dare raise your hand and question, hello? <laughs> no, go ahead. No, I'm joking. <laughs> We as adults sometimes shrink back a little bit when these conversations come up. Imagine you're 13, you're 15, you're 17. You're in academia. Obviously, the teacher, the professor has to know more than you know, or else they wouldn't be up there and you wouldn't be sitting at the desk. So they often don't speak up. Have you guys ever heard of theistic evolution? There are people that believe in a God, but they also want to fit in with the evolutionary people. So it's theistic evolution. And the days weren't 24-hour periods. They were hundreds of thousands of millions of years. Yet when you read through the Hebrew word for day is the same there as it is where it literally means a day. Yet they're trying to mesh these things together. They're trying to put a square peg in a round hole because they want God and they want evolution. When I speak to people and I tell them that I believe in evolution within a species, we have many dogs, many dogs, many cats, many horses. They've evolved into different short hair, long hair, long legs, short legs, long, short, tall, big, right? We know this. But you didn't have something that was a non-living thing that somehow became a single-celled object that somehow became something that lived in the ocean that somehow grew lungs and walked out of the ocean at some point and became everything that we see on the planet. This is just not logical. I don't care how they make it sound. It makes no sense. Yet when we speak up against it, they look at us like we're crazy. So, I tell them, I don't have that much blind faith. They say we as Christians have blind faith. We actually don't have a blind faith. Our faith is built on evidence. They say blind faith, but our faith is built on evidence. It is just too fractured to be anything more than a fairy tale. Yet they tell us that our belief is a fairy tale. In 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 20, O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings and oppositions. So, in Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. <clears throat> I just happened to have <clears throat> a conversation with one of the young women that I work with, and we were discussing on Wednesday how electric cars and the way they have to mine for the cobalt and the, the, the things that create the battery, and then the battery, once it is used up, has to be disposed of as hazardous waste, and that even though all those things are dug up to make the battery, the batteries uh, distributed by vehicles that are transported with gasoline or diesel fuel, whether it be a train or a truck or a boat, so you're actually causing more pollution to the world driving an electric car than you are driving a gas-powered vehicle, and she just didn't know what to say. So on Friday, she came and said, well, I went to a website and I found. I go, okay. So I looked at it, and then we started discussing, and it got into this subject. And I said, there were only two options. Either there was nothing, and from nothing something was created, or there was always something, and from that something, everything else came into existence. And she said she just can't believe that. I go, but you believe that from nothing something came. 
And she said yes. So the conversation was over. Because I'm not going to get into arguments of things where they're not able to hear or see the truth. Yes, Dan. By their own scientists, the first law of thermodynamics is that you can't get something from nothing. Uh, yes. So there had to be some divine intervention to cause everything to be created. Absolutely. I, and, but again, they look at us like we're the weird ones. Um, if you would look at Psalm 147, if somebody has that, 147 and verse number 5. Great is the Lord, great is Yahweh, great is Jehovah. Why? I got to get my right. And mighty is his power. His understanding is infinite. That's the New King James Version. God's ways are not our ways. Our ways are not God's ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. Our thoughts are definitely not his thoughts. So God is the God of all knowledge. And his knowledge is infinite. Ours is finite. And his is infinite. While the Bible is designed to reveal spiritual truths, it sometimes deals with scientific facts. And where it comments on those facts, we can expect it to be correct because of God's infinite understanding. So we're going to go through a few things in the Bible that the Bible taught and was in the word of God before man came to that realization. Psalm chapter 8, verses 5 through 8. If somebody has that, Psalm 8, verses 5 through 8. For you have made him a little lower than the angels, and you have crowned him with glory and honor. You have made him to have dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, even the beasts of the field, the birds of the air, and the fish of the sea that pass through the paths of the sea. The paths of the sea. We now know that there are currents in the oceans. They are consistent. They run the same path. They don't vary. We know this now for a fact. Matthew Fontaine, in his book, Pathfinders of the Sea, he was born in 1806. After injury, devoted life to study of oceanography, and he published several books. It says, I have been blamed by men of science, both in this country and in England, by quoting the Bible in confirmation of the doctrines of physical geography. The Bible, they say, was not written for scientific purposes, and it wasn't, and is therefore no authority in matters of science. I beg your pardon? The Bible is authority for everything it touches. Now, this is what he said to those people that were questioning him. What would you think of a historian who refused to consult historical records. You'd look at him like he was crazy. The Bible is true and science is true. So on a statue honoring his memory, Psalm 8.8 is cited. What is so significant about Psalm 8? In the context of creation, the psalmist is louding how God created man to have dominion, which we do. We have been given dominion 
over this planet. Now, that means we need to care for it. And there are people that don't care for it. Again, many people that mother nature is their God think that we, if you're a Christian or you're more conservative leaning in your beliefs, want to destroy the planet. That's farther, farthest from the truth. I've never met anybody that wants to destroy the planet. Who doesn't want clean air? Who doesn't want clean water? Who doesn't want beautiful nature? Everybody wants it. So, one of the things to which man has dominion over is whatsoever passes through the paths of the sea. It is this expression that is significant. Murray acknowledged the author of this expression and in so doing it aided him in his efforts to understand it. How could David have known that there were paths of the sea without inspiration? He couldn't. There's no way. It's not like he was a deep sea diver. I don't even think they had people di diving the, the way they do today. What about the water cycle? The cycle of water. Ecclesiastes chapter 1 and verse number 7. All the rivers run into the sea, yet the sea is not full. To the place from which the rivers come, there they return again. The cycle of water. The Mississippi River, this is one river. One, not even the one that flows the greatest. The Mississippi River dumps an approximate 6,052,500 gallons of water per second into the Gulf of Mexico. That's one river. Yet the sea is not full. Yet, why is that? How come? You would think it would be full. Well, not just that, but God gave, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, he told the seas they could only go so far. He commanded them, you can only go so far. I don't care how much water he puts in. Again, I don't know, sometimes I think people have forgotten how to think. And they keep telling me I'm incorrect and I tell them to prove it, nobody ever proves this. Everybody keeps saying these icebergs are gonna melt, right? And they are, icebergs melt. And that when they melt, the water's gonna rise and everybody's gonna be flooded. I go, okay, how come if I have a glass and I fill it with water and the ice melts, it doesn't overflow the cup? And they, what do you mean? I go, I have a glass, I fill it with ice. Then I fill the glass with water up to the very brim and I sit it down. Over time, the ice is going to melt. Because the ice is displacing the water. So when the ice melts, it's going to go into the place where the water was displaced. I, I, yet they look at me like I'm crazy. So the ocean evaporates. Water returns to land in the form of clouds. The water returns to the rivers in the form of precipitation. The idea of a complete water cycle first was proposed by Pierre uh, Perrault, P-E-R-R-A-U-L-T, and Edma Merlet. Years and years after, what about Noah's Ark? That's a big topic with people. Noah's Ark, Genesis 6. The design of the Ark was to be 300 cubits long by 50 cubits wide by 30 cubits high. The ratio was 30 to 5 to 3. It was 450 feet long by conservative measurements. It was the largest seagoing vessel ever recorded prior to 1858. Modern shipping 
in 1844, I'm going to mess this name up, Isambard K. Brunel built the Great Britain. Its dimensions were 30 by 5 by 3, the same as Noah's Ark. Oh, a ship called the Great Britain. It was built in 1844. These dimensions are the perfect ratio for a seaworthy vessel. Shipbuilders during World War II used those dimensions to build the ships. Yet, they knew. How did Noah know the perfect dimensions for a large seagoing vessel? guest. First, let's think about where he built it. It was landlocked. You don't think the people that were living around him that he was trying to tell needed to come to God made fun of him? It would be like building that ship out here. It's like, dude, really? What? How are you getting it to the ocean? Don't worry, the ocean's coming to me crazy. He had no previous experience upon which to draw. And he built this with hand tools. Think about that. Hand tools. It's just amazing. If you have your Bibles with you, open it up to Job chapter 38. And if somebody would like to read verse number 16, The springs of the sea. What are springs of the sea? Well, oceanographic maps now show that there are springs in the ocean. Again, when people talk about the flood, they always talk about the rain. They never talk about God opening up the springs of the deep. So it was water from here, and it was water from here. How could the writer know? I don't think they'd been down to the ocean depths and seen the springs of the ocean. They had no instruments or equipment or devices to even discover it. In previous centuries, man considered the oceans to be relatively shallow. Today we know the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans have trenches in them. The ocean plummets to 6.8 miles at its deepest and it averages 2.4 miles, not including seas that don't connect to the ocean such as the Caspian Sea. How could the writers have known such without the means to discover it? because the knowledge was given to them by God. Holy men of God wrote as they were guided by the Holy Spirit. Again, true science never contradicts the word of God. So if you're reading a science, science is spectacular. We've done some amazing things with science. They can now do what used to have to be open heart surgery where they'd have to literally crack your chest and open it up. Now they can do with a couple of incisions this big and put stents in and you can be out of the hospital in a couple days. Science and medicine is amazing. It, it, it's really amazing. Lynette and I were talking about this yesterday and when I say Lynette and I, that means I was talking and she was listening. Uh, <laughs> that my theory is the further in time we've got out of the garden, we've lost knowledge. We've lost intelligence. I was looking at a thing the other day. I'm not sure if it's one of the pyramids in Mexico or one of the ones that the, the uh, Mayans built. But if you stand at the bottom of the 
pyramid and you clap your hand, it echoes back to you. Every time. Because they have a hollow part up there. If you clap your hands at the pyramids in Egypt, they do not do that. I was looking at a thing about the pyramids and the dimensions of the earth. And then they break down mathematically the dimensions of the pyramids. And they're the same when you break it all down. This is just astonishing to me. We could not build those pyramids today with all of the technology we have. How was it done? We have telescopes that can see to the galaxies beyond our galaxy. Yet people back then knew more about the movements of the planets and the stars, the equinoxes, and the more we try to learn, the more we wonder how it is they knew. I don't think we're as smart as the people that came out of the garden, and I really do think the farther out we go, we have things that make doing things easier. I just watched the thing on pizza, if you break it down, actually is pie, but that's a whole nother thing. I'm not kidding, you take the pizza and the dimension of the pizza and then you break it down and it actually pie in that part says pizza. Okay. Um, now you guys know what I do with my spare time. Okay. Leviticus chapter 17, verses 11 through 14. If somebody could please read Leviticus Chapter 17, verses 11 through 14. Verse 14, for it is the life of all flesh, our blood, that goes through, again, beginning to try to understand the circulatory and how your blood flows. It's just, again, it's really amazing. Our blood carries oxygen, it removes waste, it carries nutrients, and many other things that sustains our life. Yet, men and women who founded this country thought that men could be cured from diseases by bloodletting. Well, well, we'll bleed it out, right? Each red blood cell carries 270 million molecules of hemoglobin. Each red blood cell. That is, again, astonishing. So many died from the bloodletting until they couldn't sustain their own life. Yet the answer was in Leviticus 17, 11 through 14, all that time. The psalmist is louding how God created man. Oh, I went the wrong way. Here. Again, how did Moses know that? A guess, a lucky guess, maybe? There is a religious body that does not take blood transfusions. They do not take blood transfusions because 
of this passage. Many of them have died because they refused to take a blood transfusion. That's a belief that they have. What about Genesis 3 and verse 15? You guys didn't know you were coming to a science class, huh? Genesis 3, chapter 15. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. We are told that woman has a seed and that God was going to put enmity between her seed. In the past, many thought that women were no more than incubators. They thought the woman was the man that, well, anybody that's ever planted anything, you got to have soil. And then you take the seed and you put the seed in the soil. And then, and I'm not even going to get into it. Yes, I am. There are people out there that when you tell them, and I'm speaking about abortion, that they believe that it's not a human until a certain point in the pregnancy. In fact, many don't believe it's a human until the child is actually born, okay? And sadly, in this nation, there are many states now that are making it where a woman can have an abortion or murder all the way up into time of birth. This is, this is a sad state of our, of our country. But at that moment where, where the semen meets the egg, it is literally every single thing needed for human life, everything in the DNA is there at that moment. It is a human. It is in its most minuscule form, but it is human. So when you tell people, if I took a corn seed and planted it in the ground, what do you get? Corn. You don't say corn seed, you say corn. If you plant watermelon seed, you get watermelon. If you plant a human seed, you get a human. You would think it would be that easy. So we know today that it takes both the male and female to produce offspring. And again, there is a religious body, Islam. If you look into Islam, the woman still is basically an incubator if you read through their teachings. Okay. Deuteronomy, and does anybody have any comments? Deuteronomy 14 and verse number 8. If somebody could please read that. Deuteronomy 14 and verse number 8. Also the swine is unclean for you because it has golden hooves yet does not chew the cup. You shall not eat their flesh or touch their dead carcasses. Okay. So, swine was unclean to the Jew because it has a cloven hoof, yet it does not chew the cud. You shall not eat their flesh or touch their dead carcasses. This was one of their dietary laws. Well, why would they have this law? Why, why not the pig? Well, pigs are scavengers. They were also not allowed to eat carrion. They couldn't eat an eagle. They couldn't eat a hawk. They couldn't eat shrimp. They couldn't eat lobster. They couldn't eat catfish because they eat certain things. Catfish is on the bottom. It eats shrimp and they, they eat the stuff on the bottom and the stuff on the bottom isn't that great. So in doing, they pick up different organisms like, I can't pronounce all these words, uh, trichinella spirals, which is the cause of uh, trichinosis, the tapeworm, uh, the parasite. Why do they make the word so difficult? Ichinokos, I-C-H-I-N, 
O-C-O-C-C-U-S, okay, which causes tumors in the liver and the lungs. Uncooked swine flesh can be very harmful to humans, but they tell you it's the other white meat. Isn't that their commercial? How did Moses compile such a list of dietary restrictions designed to keep Israel healthy? Just a guess? Even today, we're told you need to cook your meat thoroughly because we're not under those same dietary restrictions as they were in the Old Testament. Um, while you're in Deuteronomy, go to Deuteronomy 12, chapter, chapter. Deuteronomy 12, verse 12 through 14. And you shall rejoice before the Lord your God, you and your sons and your daughters, your male servants and your female servants, and the Levite that is within your towns, since he has no portion or inheritance with you. Take care that you do not offer your burnt offerings at any place that you see, but at the place that the Lord will choose in one of your tribes. There you shall offer your burnt offerings, and there you shall do all that I am commanding you. Okay, we know today that the bubonic plague results from very unsanitary behavior. We know this. People used to take their waste, they'd have those pitchers and things, and they just dump them out the window. How'd they know? God had established outside, and that was the only thing that was supposed to be there. There are other diseases as well that come from the result of that. Today, we bury our waste for the most part. If you ever drive up to 15 and look to the left, there's a huge dump site there. There's dump sites all over, and we bury it. But Moses knew it many years ago. Again, just an accident, just a coincidence. No. Okay, this one's always interesting. Genesis chapter 17. Verse number 12. If somebody would like to read that. He who is eight days old among you shall be circumcised. Every male child Eight days. Why not four? Why not 15? Why not the first day? If you're a male born in the world today, especially in the Western world, I can't speak to every country, but for the most part, if you're a male, I don't even think they give the mother and father a choice whether or not the child's going to be circumcised. It's almost like you just do it. But God said on the eighth day, again, it has been shown medically that the eighth day is when the human body produces the most vitamin K. So even if they were going to circumcise you in today's world and they know that, why wouldn't they wait till the eighth day? They do it literally at the, the birth of a, the child. So what does it do? What does vitamin K do? It helps the body form blood clots, which is important in a surgical procedure. If that vitamin was not present, then the baby would have bled to death. But it is on this day that the level of the vitamin is naturally the highest due to the action of naturally occurring bacteria in the intestinal tract. It is on that day that God said to circumcise. How would Abraham have known this? He would not have, unless it was revealed to him by God. Leviticus chapter 18 and verse 5.
You shall not therefore keep my statutes and my judgments, which if a man does, then am I reading the right one? 18 verse 5. My judgments, which if a man does, he shall live by them. I am the Lord. The text says none of This got the wrong verse. What verse? Have the wrong verse down. Huh. I'll find the proper verse, but I'm gonna, it's talking about uh, the Levitical sexual code that was given. Procreation with close kin produces sick and diseased offspring. Now, we know that today, but back then, they did not. Read verse 6, honey. Yes, verse 6. Okay. Samaritans in the West Bank are of Israel, north of Jerusalem. How did Moses know that following such standards of sexual conduct would provide life? Now we have sexually transmitted diseases. Uh, and again, some of the ones that you would think would have gone away have made a comeback because the, the promiscuity of different people. In Exodus 15 and verse 25, Exodus 15 and verse 25, 15. So he cried out to the Lord and the Lord showed him a tree when he cast it in the water, the waters were made sweet there he made a statue in the ordinance for them, and there he tested them. None of the diseases that were referenced above that, uh, calamities that had come upon the Egyptians and the Israelites because of sin and rebellion, would have come upon them in right living. Example after example we have in the Bible, there's a list of some 31 different examples. In Genesis 3 and verse 15, both men and women possess the seed of life. Genesis 22 and 18, in your seed all the nations of the earth will be blessed. Uh, lightning is produced by rain. And this is the last one because I'm getting ready to go a little over. Man discovered that in the 1800s. Two almost identical passes about lightning and rain. Jeremiah 10 and verse 13, and Jeremiah 51 and verse 16. When he utters his voice, there is a multitude of waters in the heavens, and he causes the vapors to ascend from the ends of the earth. He makes lightning for the rain. He brings the wind out of its treasuries. That's Jeremiah 10, 13. And then Jeremiah 51, 16. When he utters his voice, there is a multitude of waters in the heaven. He causes the vapors to ascend from the ends of the earth. He makes lightnings for the rain. He brings the wind out of the treasuries. And again, Job, I'm going to read these really quick. Job 26, verse 7. He stretches out the north over empty space. He hangs the earth on nothing. That's speaking about the void in space. The earth is held by an invisible force, Job 26, verse 7. He hangs the earth on nothing. That was discovered in 1650. In 1735, uh, toxical classifications of matter 
Genesis 1 had already revealed that. Creation succession, water, life, plants, etc. That was discovered in the 1600s. Uh, the earth is round and not flat and not square. Uh, that wasn't discovered until the 1400s, but in Isaiah 40 and verse 22, it is he who sits above the circle of the earth. The Hebrew word for circle is literally sphere, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers. Day and night occur simultaneously on the earth. Man didn't discover that until the 1500s. In Luke chapter 17, 31 through 36, it goes on and it goes on and it goes on. It is an interesting study. There is so much more, but make no mistake, God knew all of these things before man discovered them. Well, how was that? Because God created them. God spoke it into existence. We worship that God. What a blessing it is for each and every one of us. Does anybody have any questions or comments before we close? If not, thank you very much for your time. And I'll see you in know, about 15 minutes.